Well, if you know the Lord is working it out for your good, you ought to put your hands together and give God praise in this house. Please be seated. Thank you, choir, for reminding us. I walked by Romans 8 and 28 the other day and Paul tapped me on the shoulder and said that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Anybody know that God can take your hurt, your pain, your trials, your tribulation, your sickness, your disability. He can mix them all together and it come out mm -mm good. Amen. Certainly we honor the Lord tonight and thank God for your illustrious bishop, statesman, and father in our church. And we thank God for the Bishop James Austin. Amen. Thank him for his gracious invitation and certainly we congratulate him on the 20 year mile marker that the Lord has placed him in this place of leadership in Illinois fifth and we thank God for him amen <laughs> to his lovely wife first lady Austin we thank God for you and we celebrate you mom amen and to our uh, sainted supervisor mother Kincaid we thank God for you amen tonight <laughs> to all of the wonderful women of the Lord and I want to thank God for these bishops that have come out. Bishop Williams, thank you for being here, sir. God bless you. And um, I got to admit that I'm somewhat intimidated because um, one of the preaching this, and I made that word up, um, uh, I does speak Ebonics. I'm bilingual, y'all. Um, and one of the preaching this men in the church, period, not just the Church of God in Christ, just the period is the Bishop Edwin Walker. And so certainly we thank God uh, for him on tonight. And uh, I'm praising God tonight for the praise report uh, that we heard from Bishop Daniels, amen. And thank God for, uh, God is still Jehovah Rapha. He is yet a healer. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh cancer flesh and tumor flesh and high blood flesh and low blood flesh and tuberculosis flesh is there anything too hard for God and we have certainly been praying with you and we thank God for what he's doing in your life and Bishop Austin not only are we from the same city and the same church Bishop Daniels was my Sunday school teacher amen at Holy Temple Church of God in Christ uh, so I've got the double pressure of preaching in front of the preaching machine and preaching in front of my Sunday school teacher. Amen. To the reverend clergy, the pastors, administrative assistants, and to each of you in your respective places, we certainly thank God for uh, Elder Jerome Beal. Amen. Uh, your convocation chairperson and uh, also the secretary of the International AIM Department. Uh, but he also serves as secretary for social justice ministry and works alongside me in that area of the church. Uh, and the last time we hung out, we were at the March on Washington at the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington in DC. And I think he had, he might've had some sneakers on then. <laughs> Amen. He certainly had a t-shirt on that y'all ought to see, but I ain't gonna mess with that one. <laughs> Amen, amen. Bishop, I did not see your theme until after I had settled on this particular uh, passage, uh, but I believe that the Lord must be doing something, amen. Um, I want to lift up from the book of Daniel, uh, the sixth chapter, uh, the 16th through the 22nd verses. And those that are able, if you would stand in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. 
So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, is your God whom you serve continually able to deliver you? Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke saying to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you continually serve been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done nothing wrong before you. I want to preach from this subject. Look at your neighbor in the eye. And if you owe him some money and can't look him in the eye, just look at the bridge of their nose and say, looking up from the bottom, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Looking up from the bottom. Have you ever felt like you were on the bottom looking up? Like you were about as low as you could go. And I'm not necessarily talking about the results of sinful behavior, but about life in general. The financial shortfall that caught up with you. The spouse that left you. The children who abandoned you health that is bad or going downhill friends who have moved on and left you behind time and miles catching up with you bills rolling in and credit cards maxed out have you ever felt down and out for the count you ever felt like uh, grandmaster flash in the message don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. There have been times in your life where you felt like rolling over, pulling the covers over your head, and just calling it quits. I've not just felt like I was on the bottom, but I, I felt like sometimes I had to look up just to see the bottom. But in those times, there was a question I had to consider, and it's a question that is found on the lips of a pagan idol-worshipping king named Darius, the ruler of the Medes and the Persians in this text. And the question he asked Daniel can be summarized like this, is the God you serve able to deliver you? Now that's a powerful question. Is the God I serve able to deliver me? Now, there are only two possible answers to the question, and that is yes or no. And if I can say yes, then I've got nothing to fear, and all of my worry is in vain. But if I say no, it begs the question as to why I'm serving a God who does not have the ability to deliver. Daniel was a man who had already answered the question, even though... Judah had fallen to the Babylonian Empire and the Babylonians were conquered by the Persian Empire. Daniel knew that his God was able to deliver him out of the hands of his enemy. 
in chapter 6 of the book of Daniel, we read that Daniel was appointed to a prominent position by King Darius. And because he was so effective, he was about to be promoted to second in command, answering only to the king. How many know that promotion uh, doesn't come from the north, south, east, but promotion comes from God? Daniel was initially selected to be one of three governors over 120 leaders called satraps. And because an excellent spirit was in him, King Darius was planning to place him above all of the governors and all of the satraps. But the Bible doesn't explicitly say it, but we get the sense that much like Joseph before him, Daniel's promotions were coming because the favor of God was on his life. God was blessing Daniel because Daniel was faithful and he maintained an excellent spirit even though he was a captive in a foreign land. Now, if we're depending on man for promotion, and depending on a man or a woman to recognize and move us up the ladder, we might be waiting a long time. Because usually we got to get in line behind their children, their, their cousins and them, their friends and friends of friends. And then we've got to do things that please man and hope that man will notice us and promote us someday. But if we're trusting in man rather than putting our hope and confidence in the Lord our God, then we'll become men pleasers rather than God pleasers. And watch this, the same people that we trusted to lift us up will also have the power to bring us back down. Daniel was serving and pleasing God and as a result God was moving him up the ladder and occasionally as we move up the ladder we are tempted to leave important things behind. It's easy to be so focused on climbing the ladder that we fail to take the time to ask if the ladder we're climbing is actually leaning against the right wall. Go on and preach bishop. <laughs> See, Daniel never deviated in his commitment to God regardless of how high he rose. And as you can imagine, the other two governors and the satraps were not pleased that this foreigner, that this Jewish boy captured in Judah was moving past them on the corporate ladder. Sometimes folks are happy when we're down in the ditches where they are. But they start to grumble when we're recognized and promoted. One true test of our character is revealed by how we handle the success of other people. Yeah, you can celebrate me when I'm down and out, but when God blesses me, can you magnify the Lord with me and exalt his name together? We can weep with them that weep, but can we rejoice with them that rejoice? These men did not have the ability to do that. They despised Daniel and they began to try to find fault with him. And the problem for them was that Daniel was faithful. Verse 4 says they could find no charge. They could find no fault because he was faithful and there was no error or fault found in him. Now that's a powerful testimony for the character of Daniel. And that should be the goal for all of us that no fault should be found in us. Some of us aren't there yet. We know our faults and the errors we make, but we must never be satisfied with ongoing failures and faults in our life. We should always be pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Jesus Christ. But since they could not find fault in Daniel, based upon their own laws and statutes, watch what they did. They decided that they would manipulate King Darius and get the king to sign a law that would put Daniel in the position of having to decide whether he would violate the word of God by which he lived his life or if he would violate the law of the land knowing what the consequences would be. Do you know how dangerous you've got to be in the minds of those who hate you and are jealous of you and want to keep you down for them to have to make up laws to oppress you? Come on here, y'all. Y'all were so special, so talented, so anointed that America had to come up with black codes. 
rights and miscegenation laws and Jim Crow laws and segregation laws. They, they had to make laws to keep you out of their schools, to keep you out of their bathrooms, to keep you from drinking from the water fountain or sitting at the lunch counters. They, they made laws to keep you out of their hotels, out of their public establishments, on the back of the bus, out of their neighborhoods. They made laws so you couldn't vote for your own candidate, so you couldn't run for office, you couldn't own property. America knew your potential so they made laws to keep you on the bottom they came up with crime bills and three strike laws and longer sentences for crack versus powder cocaine and although today they say opioid is a public health crisis because their sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and spouses and friends are addicted to it when you were addicted to heroin and crack they built prisons and told you to just say no they they, 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 they they couldn't spot Daniel's life so they wanted the king to sign a law that would put him in the position of having to decide uh, are you going to violate God's word or are you going to violate man's law so the governors and the satraps came to the king and they came and buttered him up and said oh king live forever all of the governors of the kingdom and the administrations and the satraps and the counselors and the advisors, we've consulted together to establish a royal decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Verse 8 says, now, O king, establish the decree and sign it in writing so it cannot be changed according to the law. See, they appealed to the pride and the vanity of King Darius and it worked without considering the consequences of his actions he signed the written decree and his hasty act was not only binding upon the general public it was also binding upon he himself see brothers and sisters we should never allow people's appeals to our ego to cause us to do things that will have negative consequences Someone said ego stands for edging God out. We must pray and think before we commit to anything with long-term consequences. Daniel's dilemma was that if he were true to his God and to the word of God, he would violate the law of the king. But if he obeyed the law of the king, he would violate his commitment to God. So my first point, sisters and brothers, is staying true to God can be a dilemma. I said staying true to God can be a dilemma. Henry David Thoreau said unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded or shall we transgress them all at once? You see, men generally under such governmental actions like this think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter the laws. That if they resist, that the remedy may be worse than the evil. But Dr. King said in his letter from a Birmingham jail, when he wrote about just and unjust laws, he made a clear distinction between both of them. He said a just law is a man-made code that squares to the moral law law of God but an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law of God he goes further to explain that any law that uplifts human personality is just and any law that degrades human personality is unjust he also said one has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws and conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Daniel's dilemma was whether he was going to do what was right according to man or what was right according to God. And daily, that's our dilemma as well. When morality is reduced to personal taste, people exchange the moral question, what is good, for the pleasure question, what feels good. Rather than basing decisions on what is right, decisions are often based on self-interest. And when self-interest rules, it has a profound impact on our behavior, especially how we treat one another. 
The notion of human dignity depends on there being an objective moral truth. Do I do what's right or do I do what's right for me? Stevie Wonder asked it a different way. He said, when I see you on the street, my whole body gets weak. When you're standing in a crowd, your love talks to me so loud. Girl, do I do? Oh, I got a sanctified church in here tonight. <laughs> he said, when I hear you on the phone, your sweet, sexy voice turns my ear all the way on. Just the mention of your name seems to drive me insane. Girl, do I do? No, Stevie, you don't do. If she ain't your wife, I don't care what society says, uh, you've got to do what's right and not what's right for you. Do I take the shortcut? Do I plagiarize? Do I cheat? Do I go along to get along? Do I do what a society that has fluid morality says is all right this week? Or do I hold to my convictions and do what's right before God? Even when nobody's looking. Even when I'm the only person in the room. Can God depend? on me to be consistent not just for show but because it's part of my character it's part of who I am every day we're in a dilemma of whether we do what's right for us in the moment or what's right in the eyes of God regardless of who's looking at us and so we return to the question of King Darius is God that you serve able to deliver you if we believe that God is our savior and our deliverer and if we believe our deliverer is coming then we will not be shaken and will not compromise our faith or the standards of God's word to accommodate the standards of men we will operate based on our faith in God that regardless of what comes that God is able to deliver me and so I love Daniel's response when he's asked the question in verse 10 what does it say it says when Daniel knew that the writing was signed he knew the law was signed he already knew what he was going to do the Bible said he went home and in his upper room with his windows open so everybody he didn't draw the curtains he left the windows open so folk could see what he was doing that 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 toward Jerusalem he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom in the earlier days. He did what he did before the law was passed. Oh my, my, my. Uh, brothers and sisters, are we consistent enough to do what we ought to do regardless of how things are changing in the world around us? Daniel didn't have to think about it. He didn't debate with himself about what he would do he didn't try to hide he opened the windows got on his knees and prayed not just once not just twice but three times a day like he had always done he didn't miss a beat he didn't miss a prayer my first point was staying true to God that can be a dilemma but my second point is you've got to be determined to stay true to God <laughs> tell your neighbor neighbor you got to be determined to stay true to God. Uh, Daniel was determined to be a faithful servant of the most high God. Uh, there wasn't any quit in Daniel. And if it came down between a conflict between the law of God and the law of man, God's laws were going to win every time in Daniel's life. Uh, there was never a debate about it. Uh, there was never any conflict in his mind. Uh, you see, my brothers and sisters, the reason that Jim Crow laws and segregation laws and voting laws and public accommodation laws got changed was because there were people who were determined that the moral arc of the universe had to bend toward justice. They were determined that their human dignity was valuable and they didn't have to succumb to live a life in accordance with unjust laws that stripped 
stripped away their human dignity. That's why a seamstress one day decided she wasn't going to give up her seat uh, on a bus in Montgomery simply because they told her to get up. Uh, that's why a great African in South Africa decided he'd rather stay in prison for 27 long years uh, than to obey racist apartheid laws that treated black Africans uh, like third class citizens. Uh, you see when that seamstress sparked the Montgomery bus boycott which catapulted a 26 year old Baptist preacher to the head of the Montgomery Improvement Association in the modern civil rights movement they stayed off the bus for 381 days uh, they were determined no matter how hot it got uh, they were determined whether or not it rained uh, they were determined no matter how tired their feet got uh, they were determined no matter how they threatened them on the job for being late they were determined that they were going to change things uh, and they stayed off the bus uh, until the situation changed uh, and when that great African ancestor Nelson Mandela stayed in prison it broke the back of apartheid uh, and the man who used to be a prisoner on Robben Island was elevated to be the first black president of South Africa they were determined uh, Daniel was determined we've got to be determined when when the accusers saw Daniel praying to God rather than petitioning King Darius as the law demanded they ran to the king to let him know that his golden boy had violated the law that the king had signed I want you to understand everybody around you ain't there because they support you there's some folk that are waiting to run tell the king oh y'all ain't gonna help me now there's some folk that, that are waiting to run and tell uh, uh, what you're doing. Huh? But we ought to live our life in a way where we can say run, tell that. Uh, yeah, I prayed, run, tell that. Uh, yeah, I didn't give up. I didn't uh, 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 take down. I didn't compromise my integrity. Run, tell that. Uh, they got there and they began repeating the law to King Darius like he hadn't signed it himself. Uh, reminding him uh, that no one could declare the law to be null and void not even the king they said in verse 12 you signed a decree everybody who petitions any god or man except for you is going to be cast into the den of lions and the king had to agree their plan had worked and so in verse 13 oh my god Daniel was there and the king came to him because he had fallen victim to the law of unintended consequences Consequences. Uh, you see, any time we make hasty decisions without taking the time to consider the implications of what we do or say, we will almost always find ourselves regretting those decisions. Uh, and so verse 14 says that when the king heard the words of Daniel's accusers, he was greatly displeased with himself. Uh, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Uh, and he labored to the going down of the sun, trying to figure out a way that he could deliver delivered Daniel from the edict. Uh, the king genuinely liked Daniel. Uh, he did not want him to be cast uh, into the den of lions, uh, but his ego had got in the way. Uh, and the king tried to find a way out of the mess that he was made, but they reminded him uh, that you cannot make the law null and void. Uh, so he was backed into a corner that had no back door. Uh, he had no option but to command that Daniel be brought forward and cast into the den of lions but before putting him in the den of lions he spoke to Daniel and asked him this question is the Lord God that you continually serve is he able to deliver you oh my God that's a declaration it almost sounds like a prayer it may have been a prayer but it was the king's hope and desire that the king or rather that God would be able to deliver 
Daniel. And so Daniel was lowered into the lion's den and a stone was laid over the opening. And the king sealed the stone with his signet ring. The accusers sealed the stone with their rings, making sure that nobody meddled with the stone until the morning came. But how many know that a stone can't keep God out? I said, how many know that a stone can't keep God out. I'm reminded of other stones that were used to seal openings. In chapter 11 of John's gospel, a stone was rolled across the tomb of Lazarus. He had been dead for four days. But in chapter 12, I preached the message chapter 12. In chapter 11, there was death, but there was life in chapter 12. In chapter 11, there was sickness, but there was healing in chapter 12. And in chapter 12, Jesus said uh, roll the stone away and he that had been dead for four days uh, came forth bound in his burial clothes. Uh, I'm reminded of Jesus who was buried in a tomb uh, that was sealed with a stone uh, and guards were placed at the entrance uh, but on the third day uh, early on a Sunday morning uh, the earth shook uh, and the guards fell out like dead men uh, and the stone was rolled away and the angel told the women he's not here for he is risen as he said come see the place where the Lord lay and you might feel like you're down and out and a stone has been rolled across your life you might feel like there's no hope no help no way out but our God knows how to roll away stones as a matter of fact he can move mountains if he has to and bring you out of the pit that you feel like you're in Daniel was down in the lion's den uh, surrounded by lions uh, and the stone had been closed and sealed up the den. Uh, bless his name. Uh, and for his accusers they just knew that he was done. Uh, that it was signed, sealed, uh, and delivered. Uh, and that he was as good as dead. Uh, but the Bible says uh, that night mm, 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 King Darius could not eat or sleep. Uh, the late Bishop O.T. Jones preached the message God can work between midnight and morning. How many understand that the way things are tonight, it don't have to be that way when the morning comes? bless his name uh, and so the Bible said that very early in the morning uh, that the king rushed to the lion's den to find out uh, what happened to Daniel uh, and in verse 20 the king went to the mouth of the den and he cried with a lamenting voice to Daniel saying Daniel servant of the living God uh, has your God whom you serve continually uh, has he been able to deliver you from the lions uh, I don't know what Daniel was doing at that time. Uh, he may have been sleeping with his head rested uh, on a lion's mane. Uh, he may have been praying. We don't know what he was doing. Uh, but he said, oh king, live forever. Uh, my God sent his angel uh, and he shut the lion's mouth uh, so they have not hurt me. Uh, think about the view from the bottom. Uh, at the bottom of the den, uh, Daniel was surrounded by lions uh, which under any other circumstance would have ripped him to shreds uh, and eaten him alive. Uh, bless his name. Uh, but he was there at the bottom of the den uh, and he was looking up uh, and it was dark in that den. Uh, it was dank in that den. Uh, the view from the bottom uh, was difficult and dark uh, but it was in the den uh, that Daniel found his deliverance. It was in the den uh, that Daniel found his salvation. Uh, and watch this. I submit to you that before he ever reached the floor of the den uh, that God had already sent an angel uh, to shut the lion's mouth. Uh, and that's my final point. Uh, is deliverance will come before you hit the bottom. They didn't get it on that side. Uh, would you tell your neighbor uh, deliverance will come uh, before you hit the bottom. Uh, how do I know that? Uh, because the lion's den uh, killed Daniel.
those accusers and killed their families and before they ever hit the bottom and so God had to send deliverance and before he got to the bottom we see the darkness in the den but I came to tell somebody that God is already working on your behalf while you're trying to figure it out God he is already he's already worked it out tell your neighbor neighbor don't worry about the bottom God God he will fix it after a while I've seen the lightning flash I heard the thunder roll I felt sin breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul but I heard the voice of Jesus saying still the fight on he promised never never to leave me never to leave me alone is there anybody that can testify that the view from the bottom forces us to look up y'all didn't catch that right there I said the view from the bottom forces us to look up lift up your head All ye gates uh, be lifted up, and uh, ye everlasting doors, uh, and the King uh, of glory uh, shall come in. Uh, who is the King of glory? Uh, the Lord. The Lord. Strong and mighty. Uh, the Lord. Mighty and he is uh, the king of glory uh, is there anybody uh, that has tried him uh, that don't mind testifying uh, that I can't speak for my neighbor uh, but as for me uh, can't nobody do me like Jesus uh, can't nobody do me like the Lord uh, can't nobody uh, lift me like Jesus uh, can't nobody uh, heal me like Jesus uh, can't nobody uh, save me like Jesus uh, do I have a witness uh, that God uh, has been just that good uh, just that kind uh, just that merciful uh, just that awesome uh, just that amazing uh, he's been uh, Alpha uh, and Omega uh, and I tell the saints uh, if he's Alpha and Omega uh, he's everything in between uh, he's Alpha Beta Gamma uh, Delta Epsilon uh, Zeta Eta Theta uh, Iota Kappa uh, Lambda Mu Nu Zion uh, Omicron Pi uh, Rho Sigma Tau uh, Epsilon uh, Phi Chi Sin uh, and Omega uh, yeah, yeah, he is bread when I'm hungry, water when I'm thirsty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is there anybody that knows when I was at the bottom, he lifted me? Help me preach it, choir. He lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within. Sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry from the waters. From the water, he lifted me. Now, save him. I goodbye, Illinois Fifth. Just because he lifted me, I think we ought to lift him. How to reach the 
masses, men of every birth, for an answer. Jesus gave the key. He said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Let's lift him up. Lift Jesus up. Still he speaks from eternity. If I, I'm out of here, y'all. But can I ask you a question? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he pick you up? Won't he turn you around? Won't he place your feet on solid ground? If you believe it, say yeah. Yeah.